Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. So uh, here's Yaka to talk about identity. Thank you. I'd like to actually start with a story. It's uh, one of my favorite Jewish folk tales from Europe about the 17th or 18th century. Before IBM and Krupp and everything else Lana mentioned on Tuesday, there were a lot of Jews living all across Europe, different towns, some more famous than others. And people would often travel for, for between these towns. And rabbis would often make these journeys, traveling from one Jewish town to another to provide counsel and to answer complex questions in Jewish law. On one such trip, a certain rabbi was traveling with a wagon driver he'd hired. After visiting a few of these towns, the wagon driver turned to the rabbi and he said, Rabbi, I'm very jealous of you. In every town we stop in, the people give you honor and respect, but they just ignore me. The rabbi thought for a moment and he said, well, since they don't really know either of us, why don't we swap? If I arrive in town driving the wagon and you arrive in my clothing, they'll honor you instead. The driver very quickly agreed. And so when they arrived in town, the people crowded around the wagon and showed honor to the person who they thought was the rabbi. So far, so good, until one of the leaders of the town brought out a large volume of the Talmud, and he said, Rabbi, we're so happy that you're here. We have a very difficult question that nobody can figure out. We've been arguing over this for weeks. The rabbi looked into the Talmud. He ran one hand over the text and the other through his beard. He closed his eyes and thought for a moment before looking up at the townspeople, and he said, this is your difficult question. This is what you've been arguing over? You're wasting my time. This is actually so, a very easy question. It's so simple even that my wagon driver could answer it. <laughs> Go and ask him. So I love this story for a few different reasons. Mostly because the wagon driver was quite sneaky and quite clever. And he managed to solve the situation without blowing his cover. So a bit about me first. My name's Yaakov. I'm a senior developer at WiseTech Global, which is an Australian software company that builds software for the logistics industry. And after hours, I'm also a system administrator for Smash. We have a show once a year for about 20,000 people who love manga and anime. Um, but if you've been paying attention to the story, you really shouldn't believe anything I'm saying about myself. <laughs> I'm also dangerous when I get bored, um, often reverse engineering and hacking at random things and seeing what else I can do with them. So how do you actually know who somebody is? The best way is to ask them, preferably in a respectful and sensitive manner, like Opal demonstrated in her talk yesterday. But people can also lie, and sometimes we, we need to be sure. So before we uh, dive into driver's licenses, let's first have a look at identity and authentication in general. We'll then have a look at driver's licenses, and particularly what's happened in New South Wales. So there are really three parts to identity and authentication. Um, even though there's only two words in that. Identity is really who or what you are. Authentication is then the process of proving or understanding it. And then authorization is whether or not you're allowed to do something, if you're permitted or prohibited from some sort of action. And a driver's license really mixes all three of these concepts because it relies on the last one. And you can only process authorization with proof of authentication. If I just say, can you do this, and you say yes, that doesn't really get me anywhere. And so in order to do this, we rely on identity documents. And a good identity document generally has three factors. It describes the person that the identity document is supposed to represent. But it describes just them or just a very small set of people. It can't describe too many people. If I have a document that says tall or red hair, there's way too many people that could use that document. And the last bit is it has to be an authentic document. It has to be difficult or impossible to fake. Otherwise, I can just basically write my own permission slips. And this is basically an X509 certificate authority for humans, if you think about it too much. You go to, you go to an authority, be it you know, the passport office or the motor registry, you prove your identity to them, and they give you something else to prove your identity to third parties. They don't have like certificate revocation or anything at the moment, though. But if we look at the factors that identify a person and just stop at ident identification, you get to something like a photo card. Um, this is the sample from the RM old RMS website. They don't have samples of these anymore, um, of the New South Wales photo card. And it's basically a driver's license without the driving or the license. It's a legal document under the Photo Card Act. 
Uh, but if we start to add authorization details for driving, we then get to a driver's license. This includes additional details such as um, the license class, so what you're allowed to drive, be it motorbikes, sedans, or heavy vehicles, and any special conditions. So you might not be allowed to drive high-performance vehicles, or you might need glasses or contact lenses in order to drive, or an alcohol interlock device. But on the flip side, we also have digital identity, which I think we're all fairly familiar with. It's the same challenges, but very different scenarios, because you aren't really somebody online. Your identity is just a row in a database. Although nowadays there's probably a YAML document somewhere. There's no third party to prove who you are. And so we generally use pre-agreed secrets to identify. You've got a username to identify yourself as distinct from everybody else, and then a password to prove that that's you. We provide that when we register, we can change it if you want. Uh, but you need that password to prove that, yes, this is actually that user. Um, Generally, that's the only thing holding your account together, although we've layered additional hacks on top, like one-time passwords and YubiKeys. Um, but there's no real sort of third-party attestation unless you defer the entire authentication process to somebody else. We do still have this element of having a third party do it, but they become in charge of everything, and we seem to love having new identity providers. The last thing you can sort of do with a digital identity to prove it is sort of endorse one from another. So if you've got one trusted identity, you can say, that's me, and then we can sort of piece it piece together. So for example, this person says they're Bill Gates. Uh, the username literally says, this is Bill Gates. I have no idea if it's actually Bill Gates. But the proof they provided is this, a post on Twitter from somebody else claiming to be Bill, Bill Gates. <laughs> With a photo I recognize, so unless it's photoshopped, that is Bill Gates. And then it's got Twitter's little verification checks. If I trust that Twitter's done their verification properly, and this is really Bill Gates, or at least his social media manager, then I can also be pretty sure that the Reddit one is also actually Bill Gates. So we've sort of got this divide between your personal identity and your digital identity. Uh, your personal identity being you know, sort of the real world who you are, um, you only really get one unless, say, you're in a witness protection program or you're, in a, or you're a spy, and the government decides you get an additional one. Um, and then we normally prove it by having a third party attest to your identity. Your digital identity, though, is generally just some record in a database. Um, you can have a zero if you're completely offline, or you can click create account every time you see it and just have a million of them. And it's divorced from who you are, so it can be quite anonymous, it can be quite infinite. So with that done, let's have a look at digital li driver's licenses. And what really is a digital driver's license? Well, in short, it's your existing driver's license, but on a phone. There's nothing particularly complicated or fancy so far. New South Wales seems to sort of have some big dreams. Um, they've talked about a few things in the press, but not in, in much detail. But usually it's just an app, and at the moment it's different ones, because there's no standard, there's no Apple Wallet integration, no Google Wallet, nothing like that. And it sort of sits right in the middle of that previous table. Because it reflects your personal identity, and it's who you are. But it's also a digital asset, and it needs digital access controls. Um, you can, again, have zero digital driver's licenses. Uh, or you could have several, although you can't get them from the same authority. But you could, for example, get one in one state, and one in another country, and so on. It's a, it's a recent invention that's cropped up in the last few years. And I'm willing to bet it's because somebody in government looked at one of these things and went, well, I work with driver's licenses, why isn't that in there? Why can't I also squeeze this into a phone? Either that or it's like the last thing in their wallet that they're carrying around and it's really annoying them. But it's, also, it's also not just some funky thing that New South Wales is doing. If you're here today from South Australia, you beat us to it. South Australia's had a digital driver's license program for a couple of years now. And if you're from Queensland, Queensland's eyeing it too. They also seem to want one. Um, they announced a while ago that they will start a trial by late 2019. They announced last week they will start a trial by early 2020. Um, and they've also announced that Talos will be building this, which are, um, is interesting because they acquired Gemalto uh, apparently a number of years ago when I wasn't watching. Uh, they've announced a trial for, and I hope I get this right, that Maryborough and Hervey Bay are on the Fraser Coast. So if you're in one of those two areas, you'll be one of the first people to get the, new, uh, the Queensland digital driver's license and try that out. It's not just an Australian thing either, though. In the USA, several states have been trialing it for a while. Um, Iowa, Delaware, and Oklahoma 
um, three, the three blue ones, and if you see only two, there's one in the corner just over here, like in the New Yorkie area. Um, they've, they've apparently been trialing it for a while. Uh, Louisiana launched theirs a while ago, about two years at this point, also before New South Wales. They've got a separate app and a separate system. And there might be more as, uh, as well around the world. I don't really know. I haven't been able to find too much else. Um, apparently, as well, Gemalto, who were acquired by Talus, have a grant to trial in five other states. Uh, although I have no idea if they're even going to use the same system in those states as Queensland, for example. And once you take a driver's license and make it a digital record and you put it on your phone, there's a bunch of really neat things you can do. The, f the f most obvious positive aspect of it is there's one less card to carry around. Uh, it has no additional weight to install an app on your phone and it has no additional bulk. One of the cool things you can actually do with it is limit access to different readers. So if I need to prove my identity to somebody at the moment and I hand them my driver's license, they can see everything on it. They can see my name, they can see my date of birth, they can see my address. If I just want to get into a pub and all they need to know is I'm over 18, in theory with a digital license, I can just send that bit of data to them and say, I'm over 18, but you don't need to know anything else. Apparently, Queensland actually applied this partly to the physical license and removed addresses, although I haven't actually seen a Queensland license. Uh, that's just what I've read. In theory as well, if you lose your physical license, somebody can use that and find information about you. If you lose a digital license, you can wipe it remotely or more practically, you wipe the whole phone. Um, but even then, if you lose your, your digital license, you just lose your phone somewhere, it's also probably locked with a pin code, so somebody can't just figure out who you are and start impersonating you. It can be always up to date. So if you have to renew your license, or you upgrade your license from, say, a learner's to a provisional, you don't have to wait for them to print out a card and mail it to you in the post and wait a few weeks for that. You can just refresh it in the app, and the new data should be right there. And in theory, if we have strong cryptographic proofs, it becomes a lot more trustworthy. Because although a hologram can be quite hard for, you know, say, you or me to make, uh, people can fake them. But it's a lot harder to, say, fake an RSA signature than a hologram. So, so far to me, this sounds kind of attractive. But there's a whole bunch of other things you have to consider as well. There's no standard or federated system yet. And so everybody's building their own licenses in isolation. And we're introducing technology to a formally reliable system. And that one gets me every time, because we're not very good <laughs> at putting technology into government systems. This is, this is my favorite Tumblr. Um, yeah, the register commenced on the 1st of January 2014. So in six years, it has logged zero successful government IT projects. <laughs> and there's also a bunch of hypotheticals as well. Um, the weird scenarios that we have to consider in government, because government's supposed to be there for all people. You can't say that that's an edge case, we won't worry about it. So for example, what happens if I'm going down the highway, I have got um, maps on my phone using the GPS, I'm streaming music, and I run out of power, and then the cops pull me over and I can't show them my license. What happens if I drop the phone, the screen is cracked, and you can't read it, or it's cracked so bad that I can't interact with it for fear of cutting my fingers? What happens if I have no cellular data? What happens if I'm on a prepaid plan and I run out, or I'm from overseas and I'm relying on local Wi-Fi? And what happens if the other party has any of these problems as well? So it's not my fault that you can't verify my license, but say, the police have pulled me over and they've lost data. And that, I think, could be a fairly common case, because there's a reason that highway patrol cars have antennas, particularly the HF antenna. And if you're looking at that going, which one's the HF antenna? Look at the tow bar. That big one is not on every car. Um, according to the Facebook page of New South Wales Police, that's on remote, rural, and border units. According to randoms in the comments sections everywhere along the central coast. But they're expecting to be out in the middle of nowhere and having to fall back on this where the other antennas won't reach, the UHF, the LTE, um, 400 megahertz radio, and so on. So if they're relying on HF radio, I'm probably not going to have LTE either. Now, being on the Gold Coast, I tried to find a photo from Queensland's Road Policing Command, but apparently they don't invest as much in photography propaganda as New South Wales Police does. <laughs> they didn't really have any good photos. And if we think a bit broader, you know, how do I verify an international interstate license? Like, this is one's actually a problem today. This isn't just a hypothetical. My phone has my New South Wales license, and somebody else might have a South Australian license, and the two have no idea how to talk to each other. 
but also what if I'm overseas and you know, say there's an instruction guide of how to verify a New South Wales license uh, and I'm in France. Are they going to trust that this random thing on my phone is actually a license? What about the international driver's permit system? If you're not familiar with this one, if you have a normal license, you can go basically to the NRMA, pay them a fee, and they'll give you an international driver's permit. And basically, it's a book with all the fields from your license translated into like eight or nine different languages. But it requires that you keep the original license on you at all times. So if that's now on my phone, we get back into all those problems as well. Well, what happens if I need to keep a copy for record keeping purposes? Like when I signed up at Telstra, they took a photocopy of my license. Or when I went and hired a car. Um, do they photocopy my phone? What are they supposed to do in this scenario? Or what if it's not even a business, it's just another random person? So I'm driving down the street, I hit somebody, pull over to the side and exchange details. You know, do I have to take a photo of the screen on their phone? What exactly are we supposed to do here? And then we can get into some of the bigger issues. What about the, the uh, ability for police state monitoring? Um, when this came up on Twitter about six or eight months ago, a few people were like, oh, if the government has an app on my phone, what they're going to do is they're going to use the GPS to monitor everywhere I go and how fast I get there and automatically send me speeding fines. <laughs> Bit paranoid, but they could do that. I'd be more worried with them having location data rather than the movement data, though. Um, and actually, when the New South Wales app launched, they sort of forgot to clear out all of the Android permissions they weren't using, and that caused quite a bit of a stink up in the media. But since there's no standard, and everyone's just sort of doing what they're thinking of, um, what about the privacy implications of any given implementation? Uh, the one that caught my alarm the most was one of the um, articles in America, I forget which state, were saying that what they can do is have the driver's license app emit a Bluetooth low energy beacon. And so, It'll emit an identifier. So when the police pull you over, they already know who's driving the car, and they know if you're, you're a risk to, say, run, or if you're armed, or so on, before they even step out of their car to approach you. Which does sound like it has benefits for police safety, but at the same time, I don't want my phone telling everybody who I am all the time and letting people track me. There's a reason we've invented things like MAC address randomization, because even just shopping centers are abusing the ability to track people. And what about identity theft and forgeries? Because whilst, you know, say a digital signature should be a lot harder to forge than a hologram, you have to make sure you've got a really good digital signature. If you do it really poorly, somebody could just imitate it and create a fake license fairly easily. All you need to do is basically be able to code or Photoshop, uh, and those aren't really high effort things you have to be able to do compared to building custom license uh, manufacturing equipment. So with all that done, let's have a look at what's happened in New South Wales. Since a license is a legal document, the foundations of all of this is a new legal amendment. And if you've never read a legal amendment before, it's actually fairly easy. It's basically a pull request for the law. So Parliament is essentially just people arguing about pull requests all day. Um, it's you know, got insert this, omit this, insert this after that section. I'll say it is a lot nicer than some of the diffs GitHub manages to give me. <laughs> But there's, there's some key sections to this that really bring it all together. Uh, the first one is that any digital license approved by the authority is now a license. Now, this could be somewhat problematic, um, like the, the very loose phrasing from, I think it was yesterday's keynote, of you know, any voting mechanism chosen. Similarly, any license mechanism approved is now, and you have to trust that they're going to sort of approve the right things. The thing I like about this, though, is that during the trial, they didn't approve it as a license. It was purely a trial. And so during the trial period, it didn't count as a legal license. You still had to carry your card. As soon as they go, we've approved this with no changes to the law, it then goes into effect. But possibly the most important one for the privacy conscious is you do not have to give your phone to the person trying to verify your license. And this includes police. They can look. Maybe they can touch. They definitely cannot take. The next section that caught my interest was Road Rules 299 and 300. If you're not familiar with those, Rule 300 is use of a mobile phone while driving, and 299 is use of uh, something along the lines of like visual display unit. It's basically things that aren't phones, but like using a laptop or using an iPad while driving. Uh, because it's very vaguely worded. 
And so the way that the police have interpreted it is if you've got the engine on and you touch your phone, that's using your phone while driving. Um, so they want to catch people out at the lights, but if you've pulled over somewhere safe, it should be fine. But for example, they've been finding people who will go to the McDonald's drive through use their phone to tap the credit card reader, and that's using your phone while driving. So what they've done here is they've put in an explicit um, exclusion that if a police officer asks you for your license and you're driving, you can then go and get your phone, unlock it, hand it to the police, and they can't fine you for using your phone while driving. But if you go for it before they ask, you might still be up for a fine. So you have to be very careful on the timing. <sighs> I really don't like the way they've worded those road rules. They actually don't like it either, by the way. Um, the national heavy vehicle something something is trying to reword it to change it so that you can do things like pull over and just use your phone without shutting off the engine and things like that. And the last section that got my interest is that Service New South Wales now has access to the license data. So clearly they're in charge of the digital side and that's probably a good thing because their technology usually works. I use it uh, fairly regularly, fairly regularly for things like applying for working with children's check. I did that online, it was fairly seamless and it just worked. Um, renewing car registration also, also generally just works quite nice. The only time I've had an issue with Service New South Wales systems was when the government decided to retroactively lower the cost of compulsory third party insurance. And so they put out a statement saying, hey, log into the website and get $100. <laughs> Their website crashed so fast. They did not expect it. So maybe if we, if we Google it, we can see what they're doing with it. And so this is the sort of the oldest first article I could come across, which says that they're going to use the blockchain. <laughs> Run a screaming. Aside from all the issues of blockchain um, and the fact that there's really been no successful production deployment of a blockchain-based technology, it doesn't make sense for something like this at all. For a start, it's distributed. <coughs> and as you've got a distributed ledger containing personal information, names, addresses, and photos, you really don't want that. And then that would mean people have the ability to read this and query this and look for changes and things like that. So the good news is they haven't actually used this. This seems to have been a buzzword PR stunt sort of thing. I've been told they're not using it, and it just makes more sense to use like a SQL database anyway. So let's have a look at what they've actually done. And if you look at the app, the first thing you're asked is to log in with their own digital identity provider. And so if you've got you know, email address and password, it's fairly standard. Um, they say you can log in with fingerprint or face ID. Um, and they'll also ask you to set up a four-digit PIN so that you don't have to type your password every single time. This is like fairly standard stuff. And so you can use you know, Face ID, Touch ID. I don't know what it's called on Android, but it's authentication require dot, dot, dot. <laughs> That's just stock Samsung OS. I didn't do that. I didn't break it. And then once you get in, if you, this is your first time and you're accounting to Roads and Maritime, they'll prompt you to sign up for a digital license, accept some basic terms and conditions. Uh, if you've already done that, it just loads in. Um, and you may also have additional cards, because it's not just digital driver's licenses. They've included fishing licenses, boating licenses, and the working with children's check, which for some reason isn't a license and is still there. And this is basically what a license looks like. <laughs> we'll come back to that. Uh, it's very, very similar to the existing card. And it has all your main fields. It's got your name, your address, your license number, your expiry. Uh, it's got a signature down the bottom. If I were to scroll a bit longer, it's got a document ID number which I, I don't really know why they need it. Um, it's also got, in the top left corner, we've got that, the New South Wales government logo, which on an actual phone is animated. They call this a security feature. I don't think an animated GIF is a security feature. Also, the big wattle in the background, the rainbowy bit, um, that's linked to the gyroscope or accelerometer. And as you tilt your phone, it acts like a hologram. <laughs> They also called that a security feature, and I don't think linking the gyro to OpenGL is, con is really a security feature. But then lastly, we've got this big thing that looks like some sort of alien transmission. It's actually just a very dense QR code. Your QR code is essentially a 2D barcode. Um, there are, it has friends. Like, it is not the only form of 2D barcode. The Louisiana license system uses a PDF-417, but generally software developers go, I need a barcode, I'll use a QR code. And that seems to be what they've done here. 
And so if you want to verify the license, you can scan that QR code and you get back one of three states. You get yay, nay, or it was valid. You should probably refresh it and try again because that wasn't the latest info. Um, this is, these are the screens the trial originally launched with. Uh, they've changed the valid screen, but I'll get to more on that later. And it also doesn't work while you're offline at the moment. Uh, on top of having some level of cryptographic security, I believe, uh, it also hits the government API servers every single time to check, is this QR code valid? Is this QR code valid? So technically, they could use this like track people or build up a social graph as people that scan each other's licenses. You could, as you could see, if you know that one particular account, say, works at Hertz, you could get everybody who's rented a car that day. Um, I don't think they're actually doing this. They keep talking about how they've built it with privacy. Privacy is first and foremost. They seem genuine about it. But in theory, a change in regime and a server site update, and that could all change. But if we actually scan the QR code, we'll just get out a bunch of text. And I've seen enough Base64 in my time to know that this really does look like Base64. We've also got three dots. So if we, if we just, say, ignore that leading one dot, we've got three Base64 fields separated by dots. This sounds a lot like a JSON web token, because a JSON web token is also three Base64 fields separated by dots. So maybe we can just take that, try and pass as a JSON web token. We can just paste it into here. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a JSON web token at all. Normally, a JSON web token has a header describing how you would um, validate it or decrypt it. And that isn't what we've got here. The payload section just didn't decode. It's come back as an empty object. And just now that we've color coded it, the size of the signature looks off to me as well. So let's try passing it by hand and seeing what happens. So if we take that header section, ignoring the leading one section, if we take the header section, it's a JSON object. Um, we've got P, which is a Unix timestamp. The way computers count is by counting the number of seconds between 1970 and 2038. We hope that will change. Um, <laughs> we've got U, which is a GUID of some sort. My guess is it's a user ID. I'll skip S for just a second. We've got C and T, which are both one. My guess is these differentiate different types of licenses, but I'll need a larger uh, data set to find it. So if you know anybody who has like a fishing license or a boating license, I'd love to be able to see what's in that. This S1 is odd, though. It's Base64 again. It's binary data that if you decode, it's actually so good they Base64 encode it twice. If you decode that, you get more Base64. <laughs> if you decode that, you get 384 bits. It's uh, 48 bytes. So my guess is it's a SHA-384 hash that they've Base64 encoded. And then somebody's gone, this function must return a byte array. I will encode it in Base64, but it actually returned a string. And they may have just lost control over their type system for a bit. Other than that, I don't see why I would base 64 encode something twice. The second section <coughs> has no known structure that I can figure out. It changes on every single refresh. So my guess is it's an encrypted blob, a hash, it's some sort of digital signature. Uh, although it's 256 bytes, 2048 bits, it's unlikely to be just a hash, so maybe it's like an RSA signature. Uh, it's also strangely, unlike the previous section, this is a variant of base64, where instead of plus and slash, you have dash and underscore. It's supposedly file safe or URL safe base64. But why they're then using different encoding schemes for different sections, I have no idea. And then the last section just decodes to plain text. We've again got a leading one dot, which I'm not quite sure it represents. We've then got the license number that you would see on the license, and then another Unix timestamp, another uh, assumed expiry. So as an identity document, how are we doing? Well, it describes the person, and it's not too broad, because we've basically just lifted all the existing fields that satisfy that criteria from the physical card. But what about this third one? Is it authentic? Is it hard to fake? Well, if you notice, there are two Unix timestamps, and this is sort of my fault. Uh, originally, there was just the one in the footer. And on the day that I got hold of this, I had been, um, I just finished a week at work trying to reverse engineer a different barcode format. And I went, oh, what happens if I play around with this and tweak this? I could tell that the license expires after about 10 minutes. What happens if I tweak the expiry? Oh, it's valid forever. I still have the timestamps of these tweets. It took me 18 minutes to figure that out, just to play around with it and just break it. Because then you can, you've got a QR code that's valid forever. So if my license gets suspended or something, I just have to show them the original one, and there we go. It took them about two weeks to fix this by adding it to the header section. Um, I don't know why they didn't move it 
but I add it to the header, it's now validated by some sort of cryptography. If I tweak it again, it breaks. So good on them for fixing it quickly. But that got me thinking, I haven't figured out how to fabricate a fake QR code, but maybe I don't need to. Maybe I can just lift a real one, and then I could you know, maybe Photoshop around it, and it'll still come up as valid. What would like, you know, a production level fake license look like? I thought, well, maybe I could take an idea out of Pokemon Go. If you're not familiar with Pokemon, every Pokemon has six core stats. In Go, it's a simplified version, there are three. And each Pokemon is born with an additional zero to 15 in each stat randomly. <coughs> and so some people who are you know, quite obsessive with the way that they play the game want to get like all 15s. You want the absolute strongest possible one you can have. And so, but the game doesn't tell you what this is, or at least it didn't until they added in an update. But previously, it wouldn't tell you what it is. And so what people would do is they would take values like the combat power level and the health and how much it costs to upgrade it. And by reverse engineering the algorithm, you can figure out what combination of stats would get those values. But the community made it a little bit easier. And they just made apps that would scrape the screen buffer, automatically parse that info, and tell you all that info automatically, even overlaying that data on top of the game itself. So what if I did something like that for the license? If I could scrape the screen buffer, I could either lift the QR code automatically, or I could um, just overlay fake details around it and you know, have something like this. You would never know it's fake. But that's too much hard work. It's a lot of you know, graphics programming and stuff that I'm not very experienced with. So I sort of did the next best thing. I took their APK, I decompiled it, modded it, re-signed it as myself, and put it on the phone. So now I'm in control of exactly what it displays. So their app was based in React Native. So to do this, I had to modify some Java code in Smiley, which is, seems to be their equivalent of MSIL. Um, but it's, it's JavaScript. I know JavaScript. This isn't all that hard. <laughs> and it turns out that this actually worked. That image on the left and from previous slides, I didn't Photoshop Ash into that. The app rendered that. That's a screenshot from the Service New South Wales app modified on my phone at home in a drawer somewhere. I have, though, changed the QR code. But this, is, this sort of exposes a fundamental flaw. The humans will read everything around the QR code to figure out who the person is, but the computer just reads the QR code and goes, yes, sure, fine, that's a thing, I guess. There's no other info than yay or nay. Like if my phone looked up that data and showed it to me, I could trust it a lot more. But if you've got an untrusted device that you're then trusting, you've broken something there. So, this was my reaction when I found that one out. <laughs> like the, poli the police could still look it up from their primary data sources, but um, the rest of us would basically be out of luck. Now, to their credit, they have fixed it since then somewhat. Um, if you scan somebody's license, you now get their name on your phone, and if they're under 18, you get a little badge that says, hey, they're under 18. Um, although, interestingly enough, it seems to be not present if they're over 18. Like, it doesn't tell you they're over 18, it just doesn't tell you that they're under 18. So instead of that green success earlier, I have some information from a trusted source, and I can trust that at least that's their name. Like, there's no photo on it, so in theory, you could still modify that. But that means you could only impersonate somebody else, either if you have their actual digital license, or if you have exactly the same name as them, or a close enough name that people don't look. Like maybe, you know, emitting a middle name, that sort of thing. But even then, this only helps if they use the app to check. The government has, says there are sort of two ways you can check. The second one is scan the QR code, do a cryptographic verification, send it to their servers, all that stuff. The first one is just a visual check. Refresh it, check if the little GIF is moving, check if the hologram moves when you twist the phone, and if you do that, then it's probably fine. If you do that, this, is all of no, this update, this fix, is still of no use. Now, I'm not too happy with this system, particularly with the fact that they would have been happy shipping that one to production and statewide if I hadn't gone, hey, guys, I broke it. Um, I think it really does need a solid standard so that other places don't make the same mistakes and ideally don't make the same mistakes as each other as well. Queensland's have announced that they're gonna be the first to use a new ISO standard. Um, I'm not sure if it's public yet. I've seen a couple of little different snippets online hinting at it. Um, I haven't actually read the standard yet. I would love to. 
It's supposed to also work across countries, having a big international standard. Um, Queensland said that they, um, their licenses would be scannable in the UK and France, for example. So that might solve some of our international problems. But at the same time, though, that means we now have three states in Australia with three completely different implementations. <laughs> it feels like that XKCD where you've got you know, four standards, this is a problem, we need to fix it, and now we have five. The license in New South Wales, I don't think, is entirely trustworthy, but it's probably good enough. You would either need their fake license to imitate, their license to imitate them, or you would need a license with the same name. But we also generally don't use a driver's license in isolation. Normally you need multiple identity documents, you know, one from column A, one from column B. And you've also sort of got your gut instinct of this guy looks really, really shifty. So if we can rely on that, like, it's, it's probably good enough to use. I would suggest that in any region, if you've got multiple options to validate a license, go for the strictest one. Or for any identity document, go for the strictest one you can. Um, like the, the, the visual check is essentially worthless, it would seem. Um, and I'd also suggest to evaluate it for yourself because it's going to be different everywhere. And there's no sort of one standard that we can say, well, if it implements that, it must be fine, at least not yet. And even then, if it does implement the standard, we know there are implementation bugs everywhere. Uh, you just have to look at SSL. SSL TLS has a global standard, and we have major bugs in every implementation every couple of years. Um, personally, my concern is more on the server-side logging thing at this point, um, but I would encourage everybody, if you get your hands on some sort of digital ID, or if the government or Australia Post ends up mandating it, try it out and figure it out if you can trust it or not. Uh, I can't tell you to trust it. I could hint not to trust it, um, but ultimately I think that's up to everybody individually. So that's all for me. Thank you. And I believe we have time for questions. Yeah, we've got time for a few questions. So. Thanks for that. Um, reflecting on the keynote yesterday, there's quite clearly a strong international effort for academic researchers to look at voting systems. Yep. Do you know if there's something similar with identity documents like this? I have absolutely no idea. Um, the, the New South Wales government has talked recently about having a bug bounty program. I don't know what the formal entryway into that is. Um, and I don't know if, if, you know, South Australia has anything similar for people to look at it. Um, ultimately, it is also all closed source proprietary government code. Um, although being JavaScript, how close can it really be, at least on the client side? Um, but I don't know if there's any sort of effort for essentially auditing this and monitoring it. Um, thanks for that. That was uh, Where great. are you? Hello, over here. Yeah, hello. Um, I'm sorry you had to dig through the legislation. I'm, I'm told that there are clauses in there that you need to carry your original issued licence with you in case your phone is inoperable or cracked or any reason, basically. Um, do you feel that, that if that clause is in the legislation, do you feel that negates one of the primary... Uh, reasons to have a digital license? So, firstly, I don't believe that is in there. They said you have to do it for the trial, and they strongly recommend it in production. Um, I have a few times slipped out the house and gone for a drive without having the license card on me, sort of just hoping that you know, nothing goes wrong. Um, I've only been, really been pulled over twice in my driving career anyway, so the chance of that happening is fairly low. Um, but I think it's sort of up to individual risk. Like, if you're going for a very long road trip, I'd, I'd say you should probably take it with. If you're popping down to the store for groceries, having it on your phone's probably fine. Um, ultimately, if there is an issue, it would be up to the law enforcement officer who stopped you, um, who's asked for it. Um, New South Wales requires you to have your license while driving. It's not a national road rule. And I'm not sure which states have it and which states don't. Um, I believe in Victoria, like, you've got seven days to present it to, um, to a police station sort of thing. Um, but they can also look it up on their computer as well. So it's really a combination of is it worth the hassle of taking it with and what are the consequences if something goes wrong? 
you mentioned one of the advantages is you can filter what your your license displayed yeah. to the relevant stuff. Do you have an example of that? New South Wales doesn't do that, so no. Um, Louisiana does. If you go to the website for the Louisiana did, uh, driver's license app, they've got a nice little video where you can pick different fields to send to the verifying party. I bel from what I found of an ISO standard, which I hope is the Queensland one, um, that is also in there as well. So as this rolls out to Queensland and internationally, hopefully that will be in there. Hey, Yakov, um, great talk, really excellent Thank work. Thank you. Um, are you aware of anyone who's done a proof of concept app that either pulls data and fakes the liveness stuff or has just completely rewritten it to be completely fake? But would pass inspection? Um, other than myself, I don't know of anybody who's done that. Um, <laughs> I, I do know that there are some other people looking at this, but I don't know what their efforts have been and what they've done. Hi. Um, the Unix date timestamp, is that um, used only for the validity of the license? I'm hoping that they're not using it for date of birth. Date of birth and I think expiry date are strings, if I remember correctly, from pulling it all apart. Uh, and then they reparse it at several points. So I don't think they're, st they're not sending it as a Unix timestamp. I don't know if they're storing it by like rendering the string into the JSON and then converting it again afterwards. But as far as I know, the Unix timestamps are only used for the expiry of the view of the license. Um, I know that it has in the legislation that um, a police officer is not allowed to take your phone away. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, they're not supposed to strip search you when you go to a music festival. So, yes. <laughs> you know, it kind of comes yeah. down to <laughs> how that's being done. So, you know, I, I, I think for, I guess I just wonder for people generally, but also, you know, there are people that um, should a police officer take your phone and then take it to the car to verify on their little thing internally that that's going to be problematic and problematic for a range of groups of people that are probably already um, overrepresented. Yeah, I, I, sh I share the same concern. Um, I know that they're not allowed to take your phone. The motor registry knows they're not allowed to, but do all of them know it? it Just about dead anyway, and uh, we're about out of time, but uh, there's always the whole way track. So, once again, thanks to. Thank you.